Uh, okay. My talk is the maybe why and sort of how of programmable money. Actually, let me, um, what's going on? Too hard on this. I pulled too hard. Uh, there we go. Okay. I won't. I won't scoot anymore. Okay. Do that. Actually, I wanted. Sorry, I want two things up there. Can I pop it in? I can, great. All right, so if you wanna follow along with the slides, they are here on my GitHub, github.com slash chad o slash, it's a very long name. So maybe just go to my recent repositories and find it there. Uh, great, look at that, I got keyboard shortcuts. I need to zoom there. All right. Back to here, presenter notes. All right, so first a little bit about you. Show of hands, who here thinks blockchain is the devil? No one, all right. This was, is cryptocurrency safe, dead, legal, worth it, real money, a good investment, still a thing, halal? Halal is my favorite, that's great. All right, who here thinks block, blockchain is the savior? Getting Google autocomplete to give me positive things was really hard. The trick, the trick was misspelling the. And then it gave me lots of good stuff. So is it to new black or to future or to new internet? All right, so somewhere in between, maybe? Well, I guess there's another option, like just irrelevant. Show of hands for irrelevant. Libertarian, sure, yeah, I guess there could be lots of options if you want to start opening it up to that. What? The savior? You're more toward the savior? Okay, all right. Got it. So the use case of blockchain could potentially help democratize a lot of things, which puts it closer to the savior category, maybe. Yes. All right, and you were saying? It has its uses. It has its uses. All right. I think I probably agree. Uh, all right, so a show of hands, who here thinks that software in 2024 be like, pick your dystopia, lol. We got, you can help build out the robot overlords, or you can help build out, you can help commodify all human behavior. You can help foment civil war. You can help entrench new oligarchs. And this is, you know, it's not all tech. There's like small scale tech where you can do cool things that like I have no ethical qualms with. But when I was getting started 10 to 15 years ago, it felt like tech and the startup world were kind of a wash in utopian narratives. And now I just feel embittered. Um, so I am Chad O. You saw that's where I am on GitHub. I'm also chado.com. You can email me, hi at chado.com. I started building software in 2010 professionally with Ruby on Rails. Started with React in 2015. In 2019, I joined a messy little startup building dApps, doing Web3 stuff on Ethereum. And then I joined Near Protocol in 2020. Anyone heard of Near? Who, okay, so just people who know me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, anyway, it's like a competitor to Ethereum say. So if you've heard of Ethereum, then put it in the same category. Um, and then Near fired me in late 2021, and they fired another guy the same day, and we went and started AHA Labs together. Um, Elizabeth in the back just joined us as, as our first employee. Hello. Um, yeah. So if I'm going to put it cynically, what we do, uh, we are Exploiting the market niche created by bloated blockchain treasuries fulfilling their legal obligation to keep spending on their tech. Uh, if I'm gonna put it naively, right, I've, I've got Copilot in my editor, so it auto-completed this line for me, I just wrote this. Naively, we are building the foundations for the next, comma, and it was like, oh, I see you writing about blockchain. 
I got this. So building the foundations for the next more equitable, more open, more programmable, more global, more decentralized, more secure, more private, more transparent, more fair, more efficient, more accessible, more inclusive, more interoperable version of the internet. So, all right, yeah, it, it knew just what I wanted. Did a great job with that. <laughs> All right, uh, also I am not an expert except on the stuff I built, so feel free to interrupt and call me on my bullshit if you know better about anything I'm talking about from the shows of hands. Maybe there's like a couple people in the room who can call me on my bullshit. Outline, we're gonna talk about some misguided arguments for blockchain, some compelling arguments. Uh, I'm going to introduce Stellar. That's who we build stuff for right now. We have one client, AHA Labs currently has one client. It is Stellar Development Foundation. So that's why I'm gonna talk about Stellar. I don't like have strong opinions on whether it's the best one, but we'll get more into some interesting characteristics of Stellar. Um, and then I'll introduce smart contracts and we will, we're not gonna build one, we're gonna look at one and how to interact with it. So misguided arguments for blockchain, I want yours. What misguided arguments for blockchain have you heard? Privacy. Privacy. That's a good one. Yeah. Any other misguided arguments for blockchain? Open. Completely open. Someone in the back said. An immutable, An immutable single source of truth. Okay, I mean, it's kind of immutable. That one. Yeah. What's that? Untaxable. That is true, says Luke. <laughs> and oops. What's that? Consumes a lot of resources. I mean, that's not an. The, I'm, I'm trying to get the, uh, the reasons that people say it's awesome that are misguided. Yeah. If you what? If you sell coal, then, yeah, yeah, then the resource consumption is great. Universal decentralization. It's an implicit argument that I've heard a lot that that decentralization can function as a universal solution. That decentralization by itself is good. Not not necessarily. I think that is often um, prescribed by that argument. But it's kind of the it's kind of like the the savior model taken to the extreme. Simply adopting will solve all scenarios, will solve mm. all use cases. The, so like decentralizing solves all use cases? Yeah, like decentralization can solve all human problems. That decentralization somehow magically solves all human coordination problems. Yeah, like kind yeah. of like a uniform. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Oh, this is just gonna fix everything. Yeah. And this is, happens to be technology, but it's the decentralization being given a Mm. I, that's my interpretation of what I heard. So, totally oh, you can be totally anonymous. That's another good. Untraceable, yep, that's what someone said, privacy, that was the first it one. It can improve your enterprise <laughs> app. Yeah, that's a good one. You y'all came up with so many, these are fantastic. I, I didn't really have that many, I don't spend a lot of time like thinking about this anymore, but Jack Dorsey thinks it's gonna somehow bring about world peace, which might go to that decentralization thing and then you know it'll end poverty and it'll end corruption those kinds of things I uh, my I, I've got some ideas of what I think are compelling arguments and they're like immutable single source of truth eh, I'm like split on whether that's good or bad like what sounds great yeah yeah well let's talk about it later anyway any yeah, I, I would like to get your thoughts again. What are some compelling arguments? De creating maybe more de democratic access to technology was something you said, Ben? Is that, did I summarize that well? Okay.
So reducing the power of government, maybe like putting the hands of currency and banks, reducing the power of banks potentially or other institutions. Mm. Mm. Okay. Gotcha. So removing barriers to money and to and uh, giving giving like less control to centralized entities, basically, maybe as a summary. All right. Yes. Recognizing ownership. Yeah. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, give someone money essentially to anyone in the world, like, you know, around the world. Yeah. Within minutes or whatever. It's like world. modern financial technology. Yeah. Like, no one's, you don't have to wait days or weeks or whatever. No one's like checking anything. Right. So that's kind of my, the first one that I wrote down. I think over the last 30 years, we've seen technology, we've seen software slowly eat the flow of information, right? And it kind of took 30 years for that to be fully realized from the early 90s when people thought it was kind of just a dis different distribution channel. And it's like, oh no, it made the world way weirder than like what people were expecting in the early 90s when they just thought it was like, now you'll get your news over the internet. Um, so now I think anywhere you see rules around money or the movement of money, now that money is a software primitive and it's fully baked into the protocol or could be baked into the protocols of the internet, right? It's like pick which blockchain you want, but basically blockchains, it, given a, a certain blockchain, you've got money as a protocol now. Um, and identity as a protocol also in there. The public private keys or some kind of cryptography, all that, like you can use, you can build identity systems with that. So the whole like trusting every website to implement password hashing correctly or to do like OAuth, with Google and Facebook as the like arbiters of your identity on the internet, we could have something more baked into the protocol level for that. But I think this is like over the next 30 years, we'll see this happen. Would you Potentially artwork. I do think definitely deeds um, seem like low hanging fruit to me. Like I think NFTs would be a really good fit for deeds. So yeah, I would I would add a little bit more than just money. Contracts. Contracts potentially. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, this is not an optimistic take, right? Like I don't think that moving information so much more over the internet was purely good. Uh, it did some things for society that I like and it did some things that I really don't like. And I think the same thing with the movement of money with sort of like software eating identity and money and ownership it's gonna be a wild ride. But it seems like a pretty good hypothesis to me that it's really powerful to have these new software primitives. Um, another thing that I like is sort of this WordPress for money idea, right? It, there's been a lot of 
a lot of this stuff that's happening in DeFi is like helping rich people's investments like grow faster and that's fine. It's not that interesting to me. I'm more interested in sort of the small scale, uh, like this WordPress for money kind of thing or WordPress for governance. Say you've got, go ahead. Decentralized finance, DeFi, yes, yeah. So that's like a lot of what was happening with blockchains and cryptocurrency in, I don't even remember what hype cycle now, what year, what year was DeFi? 2017, thank you, Luke. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think there could be, so like say you're a restaurateur and you and your fellow restaurateurs in your city want to sell, want to give people like, a meal plan. I miss the meal plan from college where you could just like walk in, swipe your card, and eat whatever they had. So I would love, what's that? I miss the food in college. I do. He doesn't believe me. Yeah, I mean, I went to Penn State, there was decent food. I don't know. I have my choice of dining halls, and yeah, they all had different kinds of things. Anyway. So I'm just setting this up as an example where like, they wanna set up a cooperative, all these restaurants, uh, you can walk in, scan your card at any of these 10 restaurants in the city and you can eat there and it's a flat rate per month for like unlimited meals at this collection of restaurants. But now they've gotta like manage their treasury and they've gotta decide, I pay $100 a month, that's probably not the right price point, I'm not an actual restaurateur, but I pay $100 a month, do they split that evenly right up front? Do they split part of it up front and then wait until the end of the month and see where I actually eat and then divide up the rest of my payment proportionally based on that? There's all these questions around that and then there's questions around if another restaurant wants to join, what's the process? Do they have the same vote whenever a third restaurant wants to join, right? Or the 12th restaurant wants to join? How is the like governance process structured? There's all these questions that they could have and you don't need software to do any of that, but if software could help manage that and if software were like easy to write for all of these things and it were cheap and effective to deploy, then it could help them sort of like automate their treasury uh, and for the, if, if it were like WordPress for money, then imagine if finding people to help build this and then help upgrade it whenever they want something else, cost about as much as contracting a WordPress developer today. That's an interesting model to me. I think that that could lead, that sort of like small scale financial tools kind of vision is like, I find some hope and uh, interesting like possibilities there. All right, so uh, Stellar, let's talk about Stellar. Stellar started a long time ago in 2014. Um, it was, it's always been a proof of stake blockchain, so it's always been much less energy hogging than Bitcoin, which is proof of work. It's not super decentralized. Uh, some people care about this. Um, so like in Bitcoin, if you wanna run a mining rig, if you wanna like buy the servers, you can just buy your mining rig and it's stupid expensive, but you know, no barriers. Um, and then you can run your mining rig and you can participate in the network and you are like an equal in the network. That is not how Stellar operates. It's kind of a club of big corporations who run the software and you need to be invited to run the software to, or to run the hardware that actually keeps the network operating. You can't, just buy enough Stellar to be invited? you can't just buy enough Stellar to be invited, no. That's how NEAR works. You just need enough NEAR tokens to participate as a validator in NEAR's network, but the validators in Stellar are like a set list of however, they're called a, anchors. Is there a financial incentive to buy the anchors? No, no. And there's no financial incentive to do it either. So in NEAR, if you're a validating node, then you make some, every, every block you get some kickback, new NEAR is created. Um, no new Stellar is created during the validation process. So they're just running it because they wanna keep it running. Uh, there are, were no smart contracts in Stellar, there still are no smart contracts in Stellar. So it was set up to be, it was focused on global remittance payments. So that's like you move from Mexico to the US and you wanna send money back to your family in Mexico. 
that's kind of a pain in the ass to do and a lot of the services existing in the um, traditional finance world are predatory. So they were really focused on solving that problem. And they kind of have MoneyGram. Who here has heard of MoneyGram? I didn't know about MoneyGram until, okay. So you can walk into a MoneyGram office and hand them your fiat currency, whatever your local currency is. Here's $50, I would like to send it to this person in this other country. They can then go into their MoneyGram office and get out their local currency. Um, there's also this one that I learned about when I went to Stellar's conference, Beans. Beans is kind of similar to MoneyGram. It's more focused on, um, I think I just closed the slide, that's fine. Um, you'll see in here, it's, it's like a little banking app, right? It's like pay, uh, not PayPal, but something along the PayPal, Venmo, your mobile bank kind of lines. They show the Euro here, they show the Argentine Peso. This app is used uh, a lot by people in Argentina, uh, and then there's a lot of people leaving Argentina because of political turmoil and their currency devaluation. And a lot of them have gone to Spain, uh, where Bean's app is now also like fully above board, went through a government, you know, went through the, all the proper channels to operate in Spain now. Um, and then if you use their app, you can hold your currency in a variety of, you can like split it up between Argentine pesos and Euro coins. It's a stable coin pegged to the Euro. Kind of like USDC, if you've heard of that, the uh, USD coin. Um, which is like, I think this is a very cool use case, right? If, if the vision is, um, like moving money, anywhere you see rules around money, then it, I find it compelling that they have real money in their system. Uh, so now they are dropping a smart contract platform on top of this. Um, let's see, oh, my, my speaking notes are no longer synced to it. All right, that's fine. Um, I can do it, yes. I'm also at 20 minutes already, so I should probably speed this up. Their smart contract platform is called Sorbonne. Uh, it is part of Stellar. It operates within the same like software platform. Uh, you build, it, it's using WebAssembly. Who here has heard of WebAssembly? All right, so WebAssembly, if you haven't heard of it, is like, wouldn't it be cool if we could run languages in the browser that weren't JavaScript? Um, so that was kind of the idea. It's a, uh, what's the th category of thing? Anyone know? It's like. It's a runtime. Languages compile to it. So you can compile Rust to WebAssembly. Yeah, compilation, target. compilation target. You can compile Python to WebAssembly. You can compile a bunch of different languages to WebAssembly. And then something about the browser is that it's got a, it's an adversarial environment, right? You don't know, you don't wanna like trust all of the code that was deployed there. Websites need to make sure, like the code on one website can't fuck with the code on another website. Uh, or it can't fuck with your file system kind of thing, right? Like you want strict security guarantees in a web browser. That happens to also be true for blockchains. You don't want one smart contract that was uploaded to be able to like steal someone's tokens from outside of that smart contract. Uh, maybe like it can do bad things to the users of that smart contract, but it shouldn't have access to other smart contracts. So WebAssembly turns out to be a good fit for blockchains. A bunch of new blockchains are using WebAssembly. Ethereum is not, Near is. Near is also using Rust. So this is kind of our wheelhouse. This is our specialty, Rust and WebAssembly blockchains. They're also, um, when the bytes are actually encoded and stored on disk, you need to encode that somehow. Stellar uses XDR, external data representation. They could use JSON, but JSON is not deterministic, the same JSON can be represent, you know, you can reorganize the keys and it's still valid JSON. It's also kind of bloated. So they use this one, it's called XDR. The reason I bring it up is just, you've got a smart contract, you wrote a bunch of functions. Those functions take some arguments. Uh, those arguments have types. All of that information is stored on Soroban. All of that information is stored with the smart contract which gets deployed on chain. That is not true for other blockchains. If you've built on Ethereum, there's a thing called an ABI, and the ABI is just like maybe not published anywhere, but you need the ABI in order to like get all of that information that I just talked about. What functions, what arguments, what types? Um, so you need to find the ABI in the developer's GitHub or something so that you can actually build against their smart contract. 
Stellar Sorbonne is being set up to be much more of an open programming environment because you can build against anyone's stuff since all of the types are already there. You can also build really cool uh, developer tools with it, which is what we've been focused on. So um, let's just look at a smart contract real quick. I was going to uh, walk through, all right, I am mirroring now. Um, this is very tiny. Let me make it not so tiny. Great. Okay, so we've got a new version of, there we go, is that good? Good? Good in the back, all right. So we've got a new version of Sorb the Sorbon CLI coming out soon. Elizabeth built this great init command. Uh, if you want to initialize a new contract project, it's, under, it's nested under contract because the Sorbonne CLI will soon be the Stellar CLI. This is for building a smart contract project with Sorbonne, so it's under, it's under contract. Anyway, um, it initializes a new project for you. We can initialize one at Sorbonne contract init tech link, uh, and we'll put a couple, you know, instead of just the hello world contract, we'll also include the increment contract and at this point, I'm going to switch over. All we have in that tech line folder is a cargo.toml. This is Rust's like package.json equivalent. It's the thing that tells you all the dependencies. Um, and then we've got a readme and we've got contracts. And all we've got in there is the two that we specified, hello world and increment. So if I open up Vim and go in there, you'll see Actually, let's just go ahead and open the cargo toml. That's interesting. So it's a workspace. All of the workspace members are everything in contracts. So let's look at the Hello World contract real quick. This is what a very simple contract looks like. No STD means we're not importing the standard library. So that's tricky. You can't import REST dependencies that use the standard library, um, but that makes the contracts very small, which means that the Sorbonne runtime can load them out of memory faster and execute them faster. Uh, and then we've got a struct, which is kind of like a dictionary or a hash map or an object. And then we implement on the hello contract uh, these functions. So this is how you do this impl, and then pub is how you do methods in Rust. So we've got the hello method, and all it does is it takes a two argument and it returns a vector of symbols, and it's gonna say hello to Two, that's all, that's all we're doing here. So if we deploy this, uh, I am running their quick start image. It's gonna get much easier to run this soon also. Um, Elizabeth again is working on the, the way to make that easier. Uh, I think it's already deployed. Let me look over in VS code, which was behaving more nicely with TypeScript. If we get to the TypeScript, I hope we get to the TypeScript. How do I, there it is, there's my terminal. All right, so I made another project called lol, uh, and it, it started the same way, but then I added in Astro. I don't have time to get into Astro, but it can do all the stuff Jake was talking about. I love Astro, it's great. Um, anyway, we've got a bunch of contracts in here, and then we've got this big initialize script. Let's see if I remember my initialize, great, okay. Um, and it's gonna like check that the network is running and then it's gonna deploy everything in the, it's gonna build all of our contracts with Sorbonne contract build and then it's gonna deploy them all. So we can go ahead and do that, uh, dot slash initialize. The network is healthy, it's generating some keys. Here it is, it's deploying them. Uh, all right, so we know that it's there. I'll change into it. Lol. And in here, it's saving the IDs of the deployed contracts. We're gonna work on ways to simplify all of this also, but we've got this contract IDs, and then Sorbonne, hello world contract. So if we cat that, we can see the ID of this contract. Uh, so we can Sorbonne contract invoke dash dash ID. Oh, and we need to say source me. Uh, me is the identity that we set up. That's stored in that .sorbon folder also. Um, 
contract with ID cat dot this. Um, and then the dash dash. The dash dash, everything after the dash dash is called the slop. How many people have used the slop with anything else? It's like npm run if you're running your node scripts. It uses the slop. Cargo run uses the slop. Uh, we are using the slop to show all of the, on the fly, it's pulling that uh, contract off of the blockchain, which is running locally right now, but it could be the live one also. And then it's telling you uh, all of the commands that this one runs. This one's boring. We can do one that's more interesting, like uh, Sorbon. Let's see, Sorbon auth contract, great. So if we do dash dash help on there. Oh, auth contract only has increment? That seems incorrect. Hmm. Well, I actually don't know what the auth contract does, so maybe that's true. Um, hmm? Hmm? I should have tried more of these before I did it, huh? They literally all only in implement increment. That's funny. Um, all right, this one though has comments, which is cool. These comments also come from uh, the contract author. So that one, which one was that? Errors, errors, source, lib. So here there are doc comments above that, which also get included in the CLI. Um, so let's just call something briefly and then I should be done and uh, let you ask questions. So we're gonna call hello. We'll again say dash dash help, um, and we can say hello to Tech Lancaster. Hello Tech Lancaster, hooray, it worked. Uh, the JavaScript experience is similar. I'll just show that real quick. Uh, so we've got the index.astro, we import hello world from contract, Sorbonne hello world contract, my initialized script sets this up also, it deploys it, and then there's like another CLI command that you run to generate an NPM package for your module. Now then, that NPM package then has, uh, it exports all of the contracts from it. So we can do hello to, yeah, sure, we'll do that. Looks great, thank you, Copilot. Um, hello to you, then result, console log result. And, and that works, trust me. Um, I've got, one other slide, in conclusion, this is where we went. Uh, and then programming money, I wanted to like put something punchy there to a closing thought. And Copilot again came through for me. It's not just for the devil anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Copilot. That's all I got. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Sure. All right, questions. Also, I think my real conclusion would be there are certain use cases for which it makes sense. Um, and I think that Stellar is coming up with a pretty convincing, like, like the developer workflow actually feels usable to me on Stellar, or it's like getting pretty close to being usable, whereas my experience with Ethereum was not really similar. Yes? Uh, is the, so the question for the for the streaming later? There's the camera. Um, is is there a use case for actual decentralized like blockchain stuff, or is it like if it's all just getting centralized anyway? Then what's the point? I think if it's all just getting centralized anyway, there's still the point of it's way easier to build against than traditional finance, right? Like the traditional systems that banks set up are not as easy to code against. So even if it's just this like not as uh, politically interesting thing of like, yeah, it's still centralized and it's not that different from the traditional banks, but it's a lot easier to code against, then like it'll still be way easier to code against and that'll be powerful. Um, I would like there to be more, like a more interesting political story with the 
decentralization piece, but like, I don't know. It feels certainly more um, like murky right now as to whether, like, what that will actually look like. If you're interested in that, there's a fun conference called DWeb Camp that's more, it's not just blockchain, it's like the whole decentralized web of which blockchain might play a part, but probably a small part, but it's kind of focused on that like building a web that is totally uh, like private and sensor proof and decentralized and local first and all of that kind of stuff. So there are people working on that, but it's definitely all more early stages even than what we talked about here. Zach. One of the interesting things that is, uh, that's been popping up in like other blockchains is like uh, mirrors, quote unquote, ledgers that are built on non-blockchain technologies. So for instance, like uh, Ethereum and SVs and trying to track down other contracts, there are services that are basically like uh, querying, validating blocks that they come in, but then storing that. Uh, so this is kind of, to rephrase the question again for the, for the streaming, um, there are a lot of people building solutions for looking at blockchain data in more traditional ways, uh, in, with a relational database, something like that. Does Stellar have something similar? Not enough of something similar yet is my understanding. I'm not, by no means a Stellar expert. Like Stellar is a vast world in itself and we were brought in to do very specific things with Sorbonne and we've kind of been myopic. Um, but the problem of viewing blockchain data, like you kind of need that kind of, uh, I, I can't, the word for it is escaping me right now, but you kind of need that other layer where it's like you've got the raw blockchain and then you've got this like data transformation layer that's almost, yeah, that's almost specific to a, a given app because querying all of the historical data from the on-chain ledger is very tricky or maybe impossible, so you've got to kind of like build it up and build a representation of the thing that your app needs. Um, it reminds me, there was a talk I saw years ago about like event stream databases and like the log of everything that ever happened in your system is the source of truth. And then you can like replay that and make a graph database and make a relational database and make what uh, like non uh, what are what's uh, the, Document store, yeah, MongoDB, right? You could have like all of these, which are all sort of transient. You could rebuild them from, they're like projections of the event stream. So that's kind of my mental model of what you kind of need there. Um, and it's still very much an unsolved problem, that like projections piece. I can't think of the better name for it. Graph protocol is one of the big players in that space for Ethereum. Um, yeah. and and gr the gra graph protocol is trying to be decentralized. It's very expensive to use uh, because like ideally you will have this vision of fully decentralized apps, uh, but keeping that piece of it decentralized is very hard. Other questions? I have a quick technical question. So sure. the smart contracts on Sorbonne there are sort of programmed in Rust and then mm -hmm. in blockchain. I'm curious, uh, like in Rust program, there's uh, this notion of uh, panicking where you, you have some kind of error in, in your software and it'll just actually unwrap or expect and it'll, it'll exit. Like if I was running it on a shell, it would just give me an error code. What would happen in the, in the chain if I was like reading that contract and there was mm -hmm. panic? Does that make sense? Like, yeah, so you were, the, just to clarify a little, a, a few things there. I, you compile your Rust code that we were looking at earlier into a .wasm file. And then that .wasm file actually gets deployed to the blockchain. And it's kind of like running in a in an AWS Lambda or something, right? You can yeah. think of it as similar. Yeah. So you call, whenever you do that contract invoke thing, mm -hmm. it's making a JSON RPC request to the, to the, uh, 
to like some node that you connect to. You've got to specify your RPC node. It might, yeah, that RPC node is probably like sort of centralized. You could run your own. And it has a copy of the database, the, not the database, the whole blockchain basically. Um, or maybe only the last 24 hours, something like yeah. that. Um, and then whenever you, so then it's gonna load up this WASM file and it's gonna execute it. And if it has a panic in it, then it just returns the like text dump of that panic. Actually, we could make it panic right now, right? We can just so it call it incorrectly. We can. Is, is, is the better way to think about it is you're publishing Actually, I don't this know. artifact into a sort of runtime. Yes. And that runtime is going to operate on certain rules. Yes. Actually, probably if we do like that auth one or something, or there's a token contract in here. Token contract. Um, and then it doesn't have a hello method. Uh, unrecognized subcommand, so we should probably do one that actually exists. And we need to initialize this, we didn't initialize it. So we'll try to like get our balance. Is that one of them, balance? Yeah, balance. Uh, how do we call it correctly? Not that. What's that? can be in it. Uh, oh, I still have the dash dash help in there, so it just gave me the help output. Oh, right. What's that? You can try, there's some way I can try to do transfers. It's something that like actually requires, right? Like if I try to transfer something, there's nothing to transfer. How do we call transfer? Okay, so I will try to transfer amount one to me uh, from me and there you go that is the that is the panic that we got transaction simulation failed so that's getting more into like Sorbonne specifics it tries to simulate it first and then it actually does the real request um, so yeah caused by host error invalid action yeah one last question. Okay, time for one last question. Not that you have one last question, okay. One last question. Maybe there are no more questions. Uh, all right, well then, uh, please donate to the pizza fund. There, that's where I'll end. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>